The West Live. The West Live with Ben O'Shea. It looks like teal is the new, well, red and blue. That's what the data analysts were telling us in the lead up to the federal election. And if the results at the weekend tell us anything, it's that they were right. Joining us now on the West Live is experienced economist and data strategist from Maven Data. We know her as the data whisperer, Elisa Choi. Good morning, Elisa. Good morning, Ben. And now, when we spoke to you last week before the election, you were looking at the data and you were referring to it as Independence Day. You really thought independents were going to rule the roost. And look, no one likes a know-it-all, but I'm going to give you a chance to gloat here. <laughs> well, I'm not a know-it-all. I'm just reflecting on what the, the data was saying to us. And, you know, when people are online and engaging with content, um, they get to be free to express their, their views. And that's why we're more accurate than the opinion polls. And so we're very pleased that once again, uh, we were able to call this election, but we were more than happy with the outcome. However, it was about the story that sat behind the outcome that was the most interesting, and those were the insights that we shared with media for weeks. Yeah, and so when you look back at it now, at the things that were proven correct in your data analysis, what really stands out to you? The key themes really drove the election. And so from the very first week, we saw that, that there was a great disillusionment uh, towards the two major parties and also to the way in which government and politics was run. And we knew that in the first week, uh, the top issue that was predicted to swing voting preference was cost of living and the economics issues of survival themes. So, But we saw that um, by week four and week five, the issues had moved around, as you would expect. And so the top issues then became um, politics and integrity and federal ICAC and, of course, climate change. And those were the two key themes that the independents were um, very successful in engaging voters with. And unfortunately, the uh, the two major parties did not. So it wasn't a surprise that I started to see the Independence Day theme coming through strongly. Mm. And so then when you saw that was realised on Saturday, did you did you feel like uh, you know, giving yourself a little pat on the back? <laughs> I think I was the only person in the country that was not following the TV because we, I, we, we spent so much time looking at this. It was like, um, you know, it's actually quite an anxious moment because, one, it's a, it was a very important election and we wanted to make sure that the key themes and the macro trends were correct. Um, and, two, obviously, you know, you want to make sure that you, you hit as many of the key seats on point. And so I was very, very happy to see that we got seven out of seven of the independent calls uh, for those key seats that swung. But also I was really pleased to see that we uh, caught the right sentiment on the seats that were out of the media spotlight. So in particular, uh, there were two seats that we're really proud of here in this election in calling correct. One was Fowler in New South Wales, which went to Dia Lee, the independent, and the second one was um, Brisbane in Queensland going to the Greens. Mm. And is there anything you look at where you go, oh, no, well, th- th- there's one that we really got wrong. The data just, for whatever reason, took us in the wrong direction. Oh, for sure. Uh, I have been poring over all our um, seat calls. And, you know, we were really off on some of them. And so we're going to go back to the drawing board to understand why we were so off. However, I, did, I do note that uh, when we called our analysis on the Friday morning, uh, we stopped analysing the data by then. So obviously, you know, timing was critical for some seats. Things move very quickly, um, particularly in sentiment, particularly towards the last few days of the campaign. So I think timing was one issue. And second of all, I think uh, given that we rely on internet usage and uh, engagement online, I think there are certain seats that I guess don't have as much coverage in the media and also not as much, I suppose, um, internet usage compared to, say, the metro city. So I think um, those are the two key things where we sort of got our calls wrong. But by and large, we got the key ones correct. Mm. And so when you say less coverage, internet, that sort of stuff, does that translate to just less data to work on? 100%. So in certain seats, we just didn't have enough media coverage. So um, unless, you know, if there was a lot of um, groundwork, campaign work that was outside the media spotlight and also outside digital engagement online, outside social media, we couldn't read it very clearly. Yeah, right. And so now I'm imagining you're going through the numbers, looking at how everything turned out. And then how do you translate that into creating a model that is even more accurate next time? 
Oh, every you're as good as your last prediction, Ben. So, uh, <laughs> for uh, for this election, we've learnt a lot about how um, sentiment um, and media interplay with each other in Australia. And this was a particularly difficult election because, or well, much more difficult than the US election, because Ben, uh, we had 151 seats. We have two major parties with minor parties and independents, uh, and we had issues that were always swinging uh, day by day. So it was a very big data set to work with compared to the US, which is, uh, in the US, it's very simple, re relatively speaking, 50 states, two candidates, um, and, key, and stick to the issues. So um, in this one, we've, we've we're going to take a lot of our learnings uh, for the next round. However, I think the biggest story coming out of this is the um, what we've learned about Australia, what we learned about what's really important to people right now. And I hope that I get to share those insights with Australia because it will help shape uh, future policy and future vision and as we rebuild uh, from this point on. Yeah, absolutely. And so in terms of Maven data, like what do you do now? Are there other things you can use AI and this sort of big data analysis to predict or to, I guess, give more insight into how things happen? 100%. So in terms of what we do, we predict macro trends in market, in any market around the world, in any major spoken language. And so we can apply this research to any industry. And so what we are working on uh, as the next project is looking at brand Australia. What does the world think and feel about Australia's key export industries? I think that will be a very insightful piece of work and that will add a lot of value to any industry. And some of our key industries have been hit uh, because of the pandemic. And so as we rebuild the economic future of this country, I'm, I'm going to be focusing on education, agriculture, retail um, and tourism. The, those are the top four so far, but of course we could expand our view to, to other industries. Yeah, fantastic. Tourism in particular, I think, would be so fascinating to get insight into what people actually think of Australia, because we know uh, it's a competitive marketplace that we're competing against countries around the world. Uh, and I tell you, I'm going to keep you on speed dial, Lisa, because I uh, can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you so much, Ben. It's been such a pleasure to be on your show. Yeah, the data whisperer from Maven Data, Elisa Choi. Thanks for joining us on The West Live.